Okay. Okay. So you get this feeling that there's a lot of things that we cannot see properly. Nice. So asking me something here. I got it. So I start with this one. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, this is was one exercise for classifying phytoplankton. Why do we have to do it? Why don't we do anything wrong? They have different biochemical properties. Well, if you into it, this kind of thing. <laughs> there might be some kind of what is my first problem if I want to know everything with this? And we are good. Like, you know, life is good now. We used to do this under the microscope. We still do it. And then the, 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 the limit can be a little better depending on the machine you have two, three microns, and below that, what can you do? Below that, you don't see. So what will you, What do you do to, to identify phytoplankton below the limits of optical detection? You take them all, but then how do you classify? Pigments. Pigments. It's one tool, and the other tool is flow cytometry, which looks at the smaller sizes and has fluorescence and helps us to do groups of little spheres or equivalent spheres that have some optical properties. And then we use that to classify them. So we have to have several tools to characterize a phytoplankton community. And I, so I'm out, I'm sorry, because I didn't know, you, you know my name yet. Uh, I am from uh, Sebimar, which is the Sao Paulo University. And you, I think this will work. No, it's not gonna work. Oh, we did. No, but then I have to get out of here. No, the movies don't work. Yeah. Magic, magic. So when you get out of the thing, okay, thing. maybe we can do um, a thing where it's going to be the same screen on both. Mm -hmm. So to do that, you can go in the search bar that should appear on top. Yeah, this one. Yeah. Uh, this? Yeah. And then we can go with this. This. Yeah, this one. Perfect. And then you uh, can arrange it and mirror this space. I've done that before. Okay, there we go. That should get you to wherever you need to. Okay. So let's see if that works this way or if I have to close and open every time. Do. There, no. Still not Maybe for presentation we can do. I show. Wait, let me see. <laughs> can we get out of this? This section. There. There. Maybe it's okay. There. Thank you. <laughs> So this is where I'm from. Yeah. And all the links should work, right? So this is how this is home. And I'm away, away from you. Okay. Nice. So uh, I start with this generally 
um, and ask, do you think we know more about the uh, South Hemisphere or North Hemisphere? No. Exactly. So we still have a big delay of knowledge. And this is one reason, right? And I will ask you to do an exercise with me and imagine that this is a pixel and we all immersed and we have our phytoplankton and we are kind of a off size scale here, but it's just an exercise. And then a satellite can pass over us and take a picture of our pixel. Can you all imagine that? So how many species are we? Or, you know, let's forget about microbiota. <laughs> let's focus on the human side. So apparently we are one single species. So who will be our average? We. <laughs> Look around and see that we are one species. And if I have to classify us, I'll have a little problem with size, shape, and color, right? And yet, this is what we want. And we want in that scale. And we want to do this in that scale because, because phytoplankton rocks. You know, they are via, via piece, do you see? We have very much a, a number of tools to do that kind of observation. I mentioned to you flow cytometer, and there are flow cytometers like this kind of instrument that look at smaller sizes, and now you have plankton in real time. And all the tools that you follow to this morning can be attached to many kinds of platforms and you're going to pick and choose the platform depending on the scale of space and time that you want to observe and you're going to pick and choose the instruments that you can handle in the sense that we want you to do holistically which is uh, have good data and so there, there's a, several mantras there'll be some esoteric thing going on here uh, the first mantra in oceanography usually is that when you have one instrument, you have none. And when you have two, you're very afraid. <laughs> so ideally you have several, ideally you have handle on how it works and how to, it is the best frequency for calibration because the second mantra is, it's better never have bad data. You know, bad data is just better disappear from our lives. Throughout this uh, PDF that's gonna be available to you, I place some papers. They are not the most incredible papers or most uh, comprehensive papers, but they have good cited literature and they have, it's a good resource for you to go about the, the little subjects I am giving to you, right? Uh, so this is one of them, and there's the, the DOI, so you can click and go there. No, I'm not gonna do this here, okay? So you're cool? So who is our average human? And what is the pixel is going to tell us? What color are we? If we degrade all of this. Well, oh, imagine the roof is off and we have to sun, right? <laughs> we put it back later, sorry. We'll put it back, the roof back. Okay? You're cool. And if you imagine that the satellite can see the plankton that is now us, but it's the plankton, but then we're gonna full scale. And we know that a large fraction is very tiny. That's not even off the wall. like these guys here. Can you all imagine that? So most of the numbers, little tiny creatures. Yeah. So 
we've been telling you that phytoplankton has the ability to change the color of the ocean and why. Pigments. And the pigments will absorb some wavelengths and not others. And then you end up with some quantitative relationship because Colin showed us that the apparent optical properties can be associated with the inherent optical properties, absorption coefficient, backscattering. And if you notice the date here, oh, Tell you. Okay, so that we kind of know about how things go for, for a long time, but we didn't have the ability to measure it. We don't have the ability to measure several of these things. So, how do you accumulate phytoplankton? You accumulate phytoplankton or carbon from phytoplankton. This one is easier. Oh. Thank you. This, and this. this one? Yeah, you click on this. Ah, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. So, if anybody seen this equation before? One, two, three, four. Oh, right. Right. But I kind of, uh, this is a modification here because on that time, we didn't know about uh, mixotrophy. You know about mixotrophy because you all uh, watch Sasha's class and then I'm not gonna repeat what she did because she did a tremendous job explaining to you everything. I'm just gonna give a little touch. Uh, and, but you know, we can't really measure that still. The rates of mixotrophy. And we kind of know uh, about respiration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm John Cruz. <laughs> <laughs> I make noises. And grazing, grazing, grazing of who's grazing who? Zooplankton grazed on. Yeah. So we, we're not, we're not, we're not good. Now we had a chance because to do grazing, you have to manipulate the sample. Like, uh, how do you guess to you, you estimate grazing rates of zooplankton? How, how do you guess if you had to do it? Okay, I'll give you money. <laughs> I'll try to measure how much zooplankton there is. Mm -hmm. Biomass. And then you have to? Estimate how much they need to eat. How much they need to eat or how much they actually eat. So you have to give them food, right? And then you measure how much it's intaking or it's pooping or it's doing stuff. Okay. There are other terms here that has to do with the oceanography of the dilution processes that dilute the ocean. So major rivers dilute the ocean, upwelling can enrich with nutrients and, and modify things. And I left you with the, some. Uh, typical values of what we expect. And sometimes we do by meter cubed. So imagine that you're using that instrument on a boat above us and it's sucking water and it's taking, what is the scale of the volume that is observing per unit of minutes? Meters. What is the pump rate? Two liters per minute? More like five. More like five. So we have the ability to collect five liters of water every two minutes. So imagine that I can express things in the, the uh, international system of units and, get, and for carbon and chlorophyll, phytoplankton use uh, milligrams carbon per meter cubed. And a meter cube is one to one to one to one meter cube. And it's very, very different from five liters. Okay, so you're always gonna have to deal with it, your representativity in space and time of what you're collecting. So if you were crossing a big front and things change quickly, 
then maybe you have to slow down. The speed of the whole thing goes slow. Or maybe if you have you know, a very homogeneous environment, you go faster. And you trust that it's going to be uh, horizontal, or horizontally, and at least in a level that you're collecting uh, vertically homogeneous. OK? I left this paper here. This is about pyroplankton uh, uh, dichotomy. And I forgot to say it. The pyroplankton, and I'm going to use this quote unquote phytoplankton because now they're not only photosynthesized, they can feed on little things. So we go, we, like, we're going to keep calling them phytoplankton because this is what we used to. So very important process, very important products. And the dichotomy that we are used to is that, you know, zooplankton, microzooplankton eats phytoplankton and then is the base of the marine food chain. And then that's why if you mess with phytoplankton, you mess with the whole system. And that's why phytoplankton is the missing link between the, the uh, environmental variables and the biota. It's, it's very fast. So if you change the you know top predators, usually you have a response from the plankton community very quickly, okay? And I left this here because this is a, a polar uh, study that uh, uh, incorporated mixotrophy. And this is one of the first studies that had, you know, material methods that you can read and try to digest a little bit of what they do. And if a zooplankton or a mixotrophic plant that eats something that has a pigment, now, it's pigmented, okay? And this deals with, sorry, we have to deal with this in our interpretation of the measurements because there's nothing we can do. We can convince them not to eat and they continue having, you know, big, oops, okay? And uh, some time ago, we had to deal with microbial loop. Do you know what microbial loop is? Nice. So our ecosystem models are getting complicated and complicated, but that's no problem because we are getting smarter and our computers are better. So no problem. We figured it out. We will figure it out. I will recommend you to uh, go to this site for more information on mixotrophy. This is a score group that's uh, being formed just to get standardized methodology, which is the subject of today. So you can standardize processes as well and the methodologies that we are gonna use to interpret mixotrophy in the ocean will have to be calibrated, validated, cross-calibrated as your fluorometer. And this takes a little effort, but again, we're smart, we have better computers, we can do it, okay? And you're gonna do, you're gonna see a lot of, uh, different nomenclature and things are still being worked out. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time with names here, but there are several things that has to be, uh, some organisms can switch between photosynthesizing or eating or doing both, depending on the conditions of the environment. Some other species can steal the chloroplasts of the organisms that they eat and make that Functionable for a while, and that's eat more and keep re renovating the, the other systems that don't belong to them by eating. And uh, some heterotrophs are colored because they have pigments, they don't photosynthesize, and they show up in the images. And one of them is uh, Noctiluca. Miliaris, which is uh, a dinoflagella, is completely heterotrophic and it's red, so it makes red tides, but it doesn't doesn't photosynthesize. There's one version of them that steals chloroplasts from a green algae, so it becomes greener and makes green tides. Very interesting stuff. 
So this is an open field for exploring and learning. And the optics of that will be, you know, a, a, a degree of advance that we're going to have to deal with. Okay. And this is one paper about mixology that I want to leave uh, in the, your list. And they uh, kind of uh, summarize what, what, what the state of the art is or where we are now and what needs to be done and what are the five, it looks like those magazines, like five ways to be more productive. So <laughs> five ways to get the mixology of sewage in the ocean. Right, it's very interesting stuff. So I, I I pick very carefully for good papers, so you're not going to have a hard time reading any of them. They are good to read and fun. And another little creature that has changes in the color is uh, the the agrotrophic cyanobacteria. Have trichodesmia here? So trichodesmia. Do you see trichodesmia in your life? It looks like the sawdust. Yes, thank you. In the water, and uh, and this, you know, it turns turns the color of the water quickly, and it floats. So it's easier to see by satellite. Very easy. But some others. This is a diagram under the microscope, and then under the fluoret, the same chain of cells under the fluorescent microscope that we change the filter. So we only see the pigments associated with cyanobacteria, not seeing the chlorophyll pigments. Here we see in reddish, the chlorophyll fluorescence because we shine the cells in what way? If you have to pick them. Right, exactly. And then we turn the light off, and then we see the little, uh, the little diazo. Okay, so we go and measure pigments, and there's something going on here that maybe with this tool you can see. Maybe there is some other trigger that you have to look into your possible data files and have the sense that the color you see is true, no one. Two organisms working together. Okay. Now I left some Portuguese words. This is our the only ones. No, there are more Portuguese words in, in the end, but you have help here. I don't have to translate. So this is Thalassiosira pseudonana. Thalassiosira pseudonana is a centric diatom. You have something downstairs for experiments that is a Oh, a little, uh, and this is according to Colin, the average optical diatom. <laughs> so if you do what you're doing this morning, that or you did the first week, and we were talking about this morning when you do chlorophyll versus fluorescence, and di using different groups of species or different cultures, your slope can be quite different, and. Like then uh, an order of magnitude sometimes. And right in the middle of this range that we know is Thalassosira pseudon. So it's like the central chain. Center chain. And this is like a representation of it. It's a little photo. And this is the mother, Mun. That's the hardest word in the here. Mun. Oh, no bad. <laughs> And this is double biomass, and this is philia, daughter, philia. So what happened here? This cell duplicated everything, everything, and then divided. We call this growing in balance. So you have everything you need to go and make another one of yourself, or two, right? And this is done in culture. Right? Do you think the ocean is in balance all the time? Well, hardly. If we have to guess, they're not going to be all the nutrients that we need to do today, right? And then 
what do you think is happening optically in this process? So first, the cell has a size, content, and then it grows, duplicate the content. And not quite the size, because it feels a sphere. It's a, the, the, you know, the math here. And when you talk with taxonomists, how do they classify size for taxonomy? What is the length that you use? My like dry sphere? Equivalent spherical diameter. Yeah, but if you're alone with a solar like this, what do you use as a size? Average cross section area. Okay. It can be a the larger uh, length. Also, we can we can compute the volume and do so. There is also some calibration to do in what you consider size when you're going to validate an instrument like this or a pulse cytometer with a microscope. What else you have to do to validate this in a microscope? Yes, you have to kill the samples. Because they move and you can't measure them, or you develop a system that requires image very quickly and it's very precise and has very nice photos, and then you start calibrating size, and then you have several shapes and sizes, and then you have to pick what is the size. So if you have to do an average size of that sample, what do you have to do? Not all of them. Not not it's not going to be an decision. But imagine you 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 have a job to do, right? You should have to see oh what is the dominant size of my community. Wow, I have to look at my community. What is our average size? I measure everybody to the average. I cannot quite do that. I have to standardize the measurements. Okay. I left you this, this link here. I'm gonna try to link because another very interesting thing about phytoplankton ecologists and taxonomists is they change their minds about their names. They do. So, wow. Uh, oh yeah. Uh. Never mind. There's a link. <laughs> it goes to a page. It's not that important. Oh. Help. <laughs> At this interesting to you? Uh, no, play from current slide. On oh, current slide. No. oh, okay. We should move back to your, your slides. Yeah, in this case, so go play from current slide. Okay. Good. Good. Thank you. Okay. So this is this is this type of one such a uh, organizations that's alga based and that you visit to check the nomenclature and the name of the species if you work with the community structure because they do change names. They do have multiple names and is a it's a great tool that now we have and people contributed. It's a it's a it's a collective international effort. So go there. Right? Who? Yeah. Uh, sorry, forgot to say that. So when you work with this, and this is what we want to reconstruct on that equation. Uh, we can measure the rate of this division and compute a growth rate, the number per time, right? So if you, you're gonna measure in cultures and, and then you can do some proxies and measure chlorophyll through time. And then you're gonna see when it's gonna show But depending on the time that you sample every day, if there's some synchronicity in the vision there, you might have a little noise around the general curve. 
uh, we could have like an inline system and monitoring our culture. But unfortunately, when we are in culture, we have a limited volume to deal with. So things have to be done in millimeters. And but you can count cells, you can measure chlorophyll, and you can measure particular carbon, or you can follow the decrease in nutrients and kind of have a feeling of the growth and what is ultimately uh, the primary production that we are looking for to map, model, and continuously monitor, right? And you know, you learn that already, that uh, uh, this is CVTS, it's the first image that we saw. And then one thing that we knew is that by the coast, the chlorophyll is higher than in the open ocean. And that is a global feature. And there's very few places in the world that you go from coast to the open ocean and the gradient doesn't exist or is the opposite. Very few places, right? You always tend to have more here than there. And when you uh, study ecology in the coast, it's also when where we have the biggest, biggest cells, the larger cells, because they can deal with the nutrients that they they need to grow, right? So, for modeling distribution of uh, sizes in the ocean, we have, we have a bittersweet pattern here, because if your model saying that you have larger cells by the coast, you're very happy because your model is telling you the right answer. At the same time, you, you already knew that. You know what I mean? So it's kind of a, it, you have to go a little further and it's, 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 it's still works to be done, okay? And in the ocean you go and you're gonna go, you're gonna go this week, next week, and you're gonna collect samples, and you're gonna make bulk measurements, bulk measurements of chlorophyll. Do they need any of you gonna measure chlorophyll in the cruise? Filter and measure chlorophyll. And when you filter, what you do? You're here. And the boat is there. And the bottle of water follow open, close it, go to the sheet, and then it's filtered. And everybody squish into a fiber. And then you extract yes, them with an organic solvent. <laughs> and then you go to the fluorometer and you measure the amount of fluorescence. Ah, exactly. But then you can do more than just chlorophyll. You do particular absorption. You can do it. You can take it into the into the spectrophotometer, scan the filter. You can do uh, HPLC, and Sasha already explained that to you. And for growth, you can estimate growth for, by car carbon fourteen. You know what I'm talking about. And ETR, I think Ivona mentioned that on her class about techniques to do non-invasive measurements for phytoplankton primary production in the ocean. And fluorescent is one of the ways that we're trying to do that. And this can go in all, go in all the platforms and stuff like that. So it will be real time, okay? What does ETR stand for? Oh, I'm sorry. It's a, it, the transfer of electric transfer rate. You know, the, the light phase of photosynthesis. Yes, the electron goes, and the shining. So that rate of electrons going by, if you can measure that rate, is proportional to the photochemical that's going into that cell. So you do that in milliseconds, it's pretty, pretty cool. It has a lot of issues, like everybody, every, everything that we do, but it's, it's, it's getting better and better us because again, it's more than the computers are there, okay? So we, life is good. You saw this, and this one has this uh, combination of wavelengths here in this, in this column here. With the, like the Newton disc. Did you do that when you were a kid in school? 
oh, you paint it in the, with the, I don't know, yellow and, and blue and return very quickly, it's green. So if you do that with all the colors, you're gonna end up with the white disc. And if you compare the attenuations, then you're gonna see the blue or the open ocean and the green of the coastal edge pretty close to that green. It's pretty, pretty nice too for outreach also that you do with this. But I, I have a question for you. So now we have that gradient. We know there's more chlorophyll and bigger sizes and by the coast, and then we want to do all the globe. Do you think that when you measure bulk absorption by the entire communities and compared to the chlorophyll, it's going to be a linear relationship or is it going to be something else? So you have chlorophyll, you're going up, and the absorption is going together with the absorption. Do they co vary? At least, hopefully, hopefully. But are this is this relationship linear? No, no. Any guesses? Explanation why? I just say. Well, it, it, it's it's okay to stop on non-linear, but you imagine that you know the optical characteristics in this gradient of chlorophyll that you're measuring is changing, because here when you have little chlorophyll, this the organisms were fewer and smaller, and there they have a different size, all different pigments, so you can have a noisy relationship. Expect for a noisy relationship, right? Nope. Now, to another paper. So you can place things, uh, our, our satellite or boat is here, and we want to characterize the vertical uh, scale as well. So we have. Instruments instead of going in line, we're gonna do casts like you did with the profiler, and we you you're probably gonna do in at, with the CTD in the boat, and then you can put sensors in it, and then you can measure absorption, you can measure backscattering, you can measure fluorescence, and usually you have you know uh, structures um, that uh, are well known and documented. And then I, I leave you with this review that's very nice paper to read. It takes a while. It's a very nice paper to read. Okay. And this is uh, also changes in this vertical structure. So we have an accumulation of phytoplankton or colored stocks or organisms that have photosystems that's sub superficial. So the deep chlorophyll maximum. No, uh, before and now is the deep fluorescence maximum. Because it's really chlorophyll, it's really biomass. So uh, there are uh, other mechanisms than just growing underneath, you know, the mixed layer, because the mixed layer is a kind of depleted of nutrients after a while. It is it's isolated from the continent or isolated from the deep water. So you start developing uh, a more favorable place for growth underneath the mixed layer. So you make a deep signal like this. But some species vertically migrate and form this. And some species regulate physiology the concentration of chlorophyll inside the cells. So that changes too. And sometimes you have more, sometimes you just have a different optical characterization that you have to take into account. Okay. And now I'm going to show you some pictures, pretty pictures. And these are uh, shapes in color that Quite a similar way you, you did uh, last week. Any any questions here? This is a dinoflagellate, 
And dinoflagellates are covered by cellulose plates. The, and the taxonomists use the this plate and the size and the shapes of the plates to classify them. Diatoms, what is that? Wow, you're good. Okay, what is the size of this? This is just for you to think about, you know, it's not, there's no solution, there's no right answer. There's probably a mixture of right answers that we can give now and we have to figure out what to do with them. And these actually, I did this by hand because these are cultures and I photographed them in the same magnification, in the same microscope. And so this is not Tilupo, the dinoflagellate that is pigmented and make blooms and eat the other ones. There's a dinner rubum, a ciliate that steals the chloroplasts from another species and gets uh, colored. And what is that? A little dream things, right? And then you need help. We need help to watch them. So we go to the flow cytometer, or here we go to a HPLC. So it's a big machine if you've never seen one. And it has a column, a Collins plane, that we would kind of make the solution the same thing and extract the pigments and then separate them before measure them. And then we buy several, several uh, standards. So the places that have this operating properly have all the standards for all the pigments that they are possible to measure. So we are in the 50s, 60s, I don't know. So it's very, very complicated, right? It's not a trivial thing. Uh, and sometimes I'm gonna leave you with, with some faces here that are not gonna be able to uh, like probably, uh, I don't know. <laughs> but don't skip some papers. And these are this is the the one that I will really recommend you never to skip. And it kind of goes through how do we figure out how to start measuring absorption in communities, how is the ecology and the changes. And this is a fur of absorption, total absorption of uh, water and phytoplankton. So what is missing here is the tritus and sea dome. But the idea here is to see that over certain bands, we were able to look at specific pigments and help her help, help us to classify better the, the communities this way. And notice that this is kind of old and we were working on bands because this is what is still what we can see, bands of light. And then Pace is gonna come and gonna ch change that radically. And then we go for the pictures that Sasha show you, it's hyperspectral of search. Okay, but we're still here. Okay, so then uh, remember Sasha? And this is for her talk, from her talk, right? So it's just to use, it's not never to use, it's just to use responsibly, right? Like everything else, okay? Questions, no questions, you cool? Right, so this is Heidi Sosek, and this is from her uh, IFCD that's there in Michael's Vineyard since 2006. I don't know, 2006 is daily. And so I don't have to go through this because you did you did all by yourself. But my question is, how the carbon compares here? Pick two dinoflagellates and pick the one that has more carbon than the other. Is 
is this carbon comparable to this carbon? In what sense? What makes this guy have a different carbon than this one? Assuming everything is the same, like this, just size. So size is a big deal, right? Big deal for carbon. Okay, so it, you're gonna see some very uh, st straight comparisons of size and functional groups that has to do with the size because they have more carbon than the others. And if they have more carbon, they are more food for larger organisms, organisms and they sink faster and they're gonna feed the benthic communities, okay? But so far I show you pictures and images, pictures and images, and then we have to, if you were gonna compute carbon, if you're gonna make an algorithm to in intake all this data and give us carbon per all for time, we're gonna have to do some approximations and there are some other models. I'm just gonna show you this one. And this is the way we do it, right? The old school is you go under the microscope and then you measure dimensions and say, oh, you look like a cylinder with two cones. And then I will measure everything I can under the microscope. And what is different between this and the previous images is that we were at 2D and now there's 3D. And 3D, how do you do 3D under the microscope? Oh, you go open the thing, it click the dinosaur flag, and it spun. And then, so some people did that. And some people did that with natural samples and with cultures and measure carbon and measure number of cells. So there are conversion factors between bio volume and carbon. So boom, you can do it. It's gotta be revised. Nobody ever did this. The equations are pretty old for a good reason. It's because it's really boring. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's <laughs> and so it's, hard. it's a hard work. It's a hard work, but you can have an image system now, and you can have you know uh, software that help you, and that gets better. You will get better. You will get better. But this is the main trend. And I don't know that the, the hard, the old school methods of doing it. Who? Nobody wants to do that for a project next week? <laughs> so, uh, and I think my appeal here, and uh, stop me at two, please, because I told you I can't keep going. Uh, I, I, I select a kind of, uh, the number of paper, if you go to the IOCCG, there's plenty of information. It's just a beautiful literature that you can follow, but, you know, for phytoplankton functional types, it's kind of a little outdated. So I put some things here to complete and I also included some of the more classical ecology stuff. There's kind of there, but it's there very briefly. And some papers like Reynolds and Anderson are two papers that if you're going to go to the, in, into this business of uh, identify or dealing with community structure, I really recommend you to read, okay? Really, uh, because in, in, in the literal sense, community structure is species, regions, number of individuals per species, meaning you have to know everybody and their densities. That's community structure. We never do community structure. We go a little closer, Oh, we do what we can, and but we are limited in the lower and the upper limits, always. To operate this, we have to filter. That's why I ask it. We have to filter. So, you know, if a salt gets into that, it's a horrible story, right? And some, some phytoplankton can grow a little chains 
and uh, you know colonies they can be bigger than 200 microns and they, so they excluded from this and so you have to do list maybe pigments list imaging and be smart computing and and dealing with this uh, this stuff and you're gonna see uh, you know several, 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 several papers about this subject and it, everything is going to change with this. I do hope so. You're gonna hear and, le and read about Hamon Margalef, the Margalef Mandala. Mandala is a, a kind of a translation word and it, it means representation of a recurring order. So Margalef, was studying uh, coastal temperate places, and he wanted to describe when uh, the, the 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 variables that explain the spring bloom and the red tides, the spring bloom and the red tides. So he kind of made this little simple model that computed uh, that, that uh, observed nutrient concentration and turbulence, in the sense that in the winter. When the waters are mixed, vertically mixed, you have a lot of nutrients because you have uh, no, uh, the, the cells are spending the time in the dark zones so at the same time they are in the light. So they don't have chance to energy to grow. And by the time you get to spring, you start stratifying then the lit area or oh, it's shallower. And then you have the chance to grow with that nutrients. You take that nutrients and then you make the spring bloom. So that makes sense. After that, the nutrients are exhausted, the diatoms died and fall off the mixed layer. And then the dinoflagellates that are mot motile, they have two flagellates, they can go up and down and feed themselves or sunbathe when, they're, when they please. So this is the, yes, the short version of, of Margalef Mandala. So if you know the environment conditions, you predict the community structure. In the sense that he's designed this is for dominance, meaning the community is gonna be dominated by dinoflagellates that are motile, mobile, sorry, or by diatoms. And some of the typical genera that he observed in the space that he was working on. Okay, this is uh, another version of the same telling the story that I just told you for this, uh, you know, from spring, from winter to spring, and relating nutrients with turbulence, but they kind of cover, right? So we start developing this uh, along with the types and functional types which is a nomenclature from modelers, because you choose the type that you need to explain better your model, right? It comes the, 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 the term traits, and the person to look for is uh, Patricia Glibert, please. That's bad, right? That paper proposed I'm not going to read through this, and it's going to take a little while for you to digest this. But while uh, Margalet proposed two main uh, vectors for distribution or for, for predicting the dominance of phytoplankton, she's proposing 12. In her focus is halves. So, so 12 stressors or 12. Uh, Tra uh, traits that explain the chance of a hab episode to occur. See what I mean here? Of course, you don't explain it, everything. There's missing information, I guess. I think it's Cocolita for it. It didn't fit in any of this, the, the combinations that she tried, but she was able to propose a model that would be able to predict uh, some halves, right? And then in a better or even uh, more ecological lineage, 
comes uh, Elena Mitchell, and she proposed uh, together with the personal, <laughs> personal is great. Uh, PFTs are. Exactly. And then uh, trade types. And now she's calling for uh, things in the environment that can be measured, quantified, and then you assemble a little multivariate model. And then you say, okay, if the conditions, I don't know, I open a sewage emissary in a place that never had this before. So the nutrient and the, the salinity and the intake of minerals and other stuff is going to drastically change. And that's going to be some uh, facilitators for some species to dominate over the others. Because, you know, they're going to all need nutrients alike. And whoever gets there first is going to go better. Right? Like, you guys have some water. This is like cell quota. Some species can can store stuff, so, but me neither, I, I cannot, I don't have a bottle. So if I'm thirsty, I have to run to the kitchen so I can die until I get there. But you, you cook, you, you hydrate it all the time because you have to coat it, okay. understand? So this is one trend, having this ability of storage is one good trend. And size again comes as a good trend, but then, what is size? How do you measure size? How do we measure size? How did I spend my life measuring size? I fractionated stuff. So I don't want to see anybody smaller than 20 microns. Chlorophyll, size fractionated chlorophyll. We can do that, right? And follow how the different size classes change. But who's to say that my population is exactly at when you know, I should know all the distribution of all the sizes and then pick and choose the filter every time. So I pick twin and I call them microplankton. Or two and I call them nanoplankton. Or five. You know what I mean? And by the time that, that Elena developed this, we lady from Uruguay, from lakes. And this is a valuable uh, advice for you that wants to study community structure. Go to the limnologists first, because they had all the time to go and collect the samples fresh, go to the lab and study them and look at them. And we have to pack the gear and go to the ocean. You know, it's kind of difficult for us to be in the same level. So there's this, this order of magnitude of knowledge that's in the literature, the liminal, liminology literature that you should go and get it. And this lady here said, well, I, I can't do this. I don't have any physiology traits in my samples because I've been collecting in my lake for 20 years and looking under the microscope. So she developed a Morpho morphology rate classification. This little lady from Uruguay, after I did a little bit, I discovered that she was uh, a student from Reynolds, so the one right? So she, but this is, for example, a, an approach that can be applied to this because it's morphology, plain and simple. And I think she had like, well, traits. So then you start doing some some statistics and it's fun, right? Because we're smarter and we have better computers. <laughs> so check it out because it's, it's a simple paper. It's not a very big one and it's uh, from lakes from Uruguay, but there's a lot to know about lakes from Uruguay, even in systems sophisticated like that. So I ask you just that to open your mind and uh, and and not be afraid and 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 this is an opportunity now that you are friends forever to communicate continuously 
and divide the because you know we know you are as we are under information overload and you can't keep up with everything but if you divide you conquer we killed the mammoths <laughs> we ate them all you can do it <laughs> right so Yoda teach you will the machine will learn <laughs> so if you teach well the machine can perform machine learn that's a great name I think it was the best expression because you have to teach it it doesn't know anything. And you are responsible to teach it better. He probably wouldn't say like this. Teach you will, the machine will. So this is from Carlos Garcia. He's like a artistic creation about the apparent inherent optics properties in the ocean. And this is supposed to be plankton, right? So ED. Interaction, absorption, backscattering, heat, backscattering, back, forward scattering, fluorescence, color. So everything is here. We can do it. We can do it. We can do it. But you got to teach the machine well. Okay. So I will close with my appeal to you. Copy. Copying uh, Tasha and I say, use pigments, but use traits, use PFTs, use size, especially. Responsibility, <laughs> right? Yeah. Responsibility. And I really wanted to go to this little movie here. If we have, it's an eight minute movie. It's all in Portuguese, so I'm not gonna play the audio. The girls can uh, narrate it for you later. But we we actually see diatoms growing in the lab, and it's something that will probably change your life. I think. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and this is from uh, 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 the name of her, her name is here, and the link you will see her as a teacher from the biology department, my university, freshwater ecologist of algae. Every time, every time. It just, you know, it cancels here every time. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so it's a silent movie. But no problem, no problem. I'll, I'll try to. So it's not going to hear anything, but she's going to go about the diatoms that she collected and carefully observed under the microscope with a good video camera. And they all alive, which is the beauty of this thing. We don't kill the plankton before we observe, and then we can go back and reclassify them. So this is a diatom, it's a panic diatom. She will put the scientific names, and you see the, the cells divided, right? So everything you learn in school. And here, she, I was listening earlier to, to see uh, what she, was she saying, but she's saying that this is a natural sample that has mainly diatoms, but these are very different shapes and size of diatoms. And optically, they gotta be different, right? These are the. Yeah, sure. Because of the deposits. Remember, after a while they die and, and the silica stay in the sediment. <laughs> Yeah. And as she's going to say that there's a lot of species that are attached to the other organisms, so the epiphytic, and these are electrical, electric scanning microscopy, so you see that, oh, it's a rigid wall, no, it's full of little holes, so she can exchange materials with the environment. 
and oh, she's a huge wall, but she can grow because she has two paths, and she can grow by adding, grow by adding little. And this is the little bread where you divide them. So in that picture, remember, you have to double your material, then divide. So what's going on there is that diatoms have a vacuole inside them. So it's going to spread the, the material and then form the vacuole. And another thing about diatoms is because it's rigid, it can only form the other half a little smaller. So one of the daughters will have the same size of her mom, but the other one will be slightly smaller. And then after a critical size, it goes through sexual reproduction. Do you, do you, do you have this knowledge? Yeah. It's a centric that one. And some can move by secreting a mucilage through this little structure that's called half. And it slides over surfaces. So these are the chloroplasts that we struck with acetone. A little detail on their halfy thing, and then it's going to show you the movements of diatoms over surface. It doesn't have a flagellum, it doesn't have cilia, but it moves. And this is real time speed. There's no, there's no acceleration here. That's the speed that they move naturally. Do they need a substrate to move? They can move in the water as well. No, they need a substrate. And some have a very large genetical material, so you can see the cell division, like in the textbooks, happening here. You know. Take out the. <laughs> and then you. Yeah, it's just amazing. And I will form. Now it's starting dividing, right? Six hours later. <laughs> and, and she's there, the dripping little drops of water to refresh the bug and so it doesn't die. I will divide the material, grow, see? The accumulation of material grows and then it will split. Long. And divide the material for the just daughter cells. Imagine you, you imagining backscattering by that second. <laughs> exactly on that moment. So oh, sorry. I'll come back later. <laughs> sorry to come back later. It's embarrassing. <laughs> and then it gets to the critical point. And when it gets to the critical point, it's going to make zygotes. And the zygotes are smaller and mobile. It, the, the, the sexual cells. So it, it goes mitosis, mitosis, mitosis. And then when it goes to a critical site, go meiosis. And that makes zygotes. And then it gets into the water like little flagellates little things that probably some of them are probably zygote and go ah. and this one is fun because the flagella goes in front of it mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> 
I thought it was backwards, but she said, no, I think that's the way that it, it swings. Some other types of, you know, when and then when you have the two sexual sex cells combined again, then you have all the genetic equipment to make a new bigger cell of original size. And in this process, they all swimming and the genetic exchange in this water is amazing, right? So the genetic pool of uh, phytoplankton is pretty cool. So it gets all the, the DNA that needs and all the instructions and how it's able to remake the original cells. And, this, and then the, the two zygotes encounter in another species to make a, a new original cell from other species. And then they combine. But this one in particular, it makes a little shell and then, and then, I mean, this is cool or what? And it makes a bigger cell again. So you're measuring absorption, you're measuring backscattering, you, there's silica, and then there's no silica, and then there's silica again. It's the chloroplast in, in concentrated, the chloroplast is spread, right? So that's it. So I'll be around bugging you guys because I'm having so much fun. And uh, please feel free to, if you have the chance to read any of this, just bug me and I'll bug you back. Thank you. And now you'll. Hydrolyte. Oh, should I stop recording? Oh, yes. Thank you.